In today's video, we'll be looking at uh, chapter 11, biodiversity. So it will come in two parts. The first part is um, the more scientific stuff in some sense, about the different types of biodiversity, uh, sampling techniques, and um, how, what can lead to an increase or decrease in genetic biodiversity. First of all, let's think about what uh, biodiversity actually is. So biodiversity is a very general term referring to the a variety of organisms, species, and habitat in a particular area. Why is it important that we know it? It's because that it refers to the interdependence of species. What interdependence mean is that uh, if we look at uh, a food web or food chain, you can see that actually species rely on each other in some way or another to us uh, to survive and reproduce. If we have make changes to a certain particular part of a food chain or a food web, it would have a knock on effect on the rest of uh, the species in that particular area. So uh, we say that's why it is important to maintain the biodiversity uh, so that things are kept relatively the same so that uh, to ensure the survival of uh, all species. So now let's look at the uh, different types of biodiversity. So here you can see there are three main types, species, habitat, and genetics. Let's start with habitat. Habitat is very straightforward. Literally, it just means the different types of habitat you can have in a particular area. So you can think about in a school setting, you can have a woodlands, uh, you can have a pond, perhaps. Uh, even the walls can have ivy growing and, and that presents a different habitat as well. So that's habitat biodiversity. Um, one of the other most common biodiversity we tend to refer to is species biodiversity and it is made up in two parts, species richness and species evenness. Species richness refers to the number of different species in a particular area. Not talk about the number of in individuals, but more of the number of different uh, variety of species in that particular place. Evenness refers to uh, comparing population sizes of different species. So it's asking the question, are the species balanced in some sense? Do we have 50% of species A and 50% of species B? Or is it 10% species A, 90% species B, uh, etc.? So Simpson's index can be used to measure uh, species biodiversity. Uh, this is uh, one of the equations that you do have to memorize uh, for the exam. In particular, you need to know what the uh, actual letters mean. So this just simply stands for the Simpsons Index uh, value. Uh, this symbol stands for the sum. And these two, uh, the capital N stands for the total number of individuals in one particular species. And capital N stands for the total number of individuals in all species. So think about in a situation where you have a total of 100 organisms so then capital N would be 100, and within it you have tigers, lions, and leopards. So let's say you've got 10 lions, 70 leopards, and 20 uh, tigers, for example. So then you need to calculate all those three numbers using the equation, uh, and then you add them all up, and then you do one minus that, then you get the Simpsons index. So you do need to make sure you no learn what it is and just follow the instructions in the actual question. Now, the third type of biodiversity uh, is genetic uh, biodiversity. Uh, we can calculate it using this particular equation. Um, having said that, it's not, it looks complicated, but it really isn't. It actually is just a concept of ratios or percentages. So uh, let's just think about the, what the words mean. So genetic biodiversity refers to how, uh, how many variety of genes or alleles that you, uh, a particular organism may have. So when we say that there is something called polymorphic loci or polymorphic locus, just simply refers to genes with more than one allele. So they can have dominant and recessive alleles, for example. Uh, but there will be something called uh, monomorphic uh, loci or monomorphic genes, means that there are genes that just, uh, there is no variety of it. It's just one type of gene, one version of it. So um, obviously the more polymorphic genes you have, the higher the genetic biodiversity you will have. So we just simply means to calculate that is the number of polymorphic loci divided by the total number of loci on a particular chromosome. So it just literally is uh, calculating percentages. You do need to know uh, some of the causes for uh, genetic biodiversity. Um, just be aware that you can see uh, with the current situation, with how humans are, with our technology, with our knowledge about genetics, we can actually um, uh, alter it in quite a few ways. And you'll learn more about it in chapter 21, genetic manipulation. And because of that, for the benefit of humans in different 
different parts, really, uh, we tend to seem to be decreasing the bio genetic biodiversity. And in some rare cases, naturally speaking, we can increase it. So here we'll explore uh, the two ways that in which we can say increasing the genetic biodiversity and a few other ways that we can decrease it. So increasing it by just random mutation, uh, mutation of a gene, or uh, increasing the uh, number of alleles, for example, would be one thing. Interbreeding usually uh, which can lead to gene flow. Now what that means is, for, let's say for example, one individual moves from place A to place B, and they breed with the individuals in place B. And that would mean that there is a change in genes or change in alleles, because we say that, for example, those that come from place A would have a specific set of alleles, and those in pla place B would have maybe perhaps different sets of alleles. So that particular interbreeding could lead to gene flow, leading, leading to an increase of uh, different alleles. If we decrease it, it usually means we have less alleles, and these are the reasons why. Uh, selective breeding, humans picking which organisms to breed for particular advantages, obviously leading to less uh, to a loss of alleles. Captive breeding, uh, because we started with a very small gene pool, uh, usually this uh, is done to uh, organisms that are quite uh, rare or perhaps they're endangered. So in order to preserve that particular species, we have to uh, capture them and and make sure that they breed. And because of the small numbers, we have less alleles to pick from, in some sense. Cloning, obviously, you're just making more organisms with the same gene, so again, you have less variety of alleles. On the other hand, random genetic drift. Uh, this refers to sort of the random nature to the passing on of alleles, so just be aware of that's called genetic drift. Natural selection, again, because of the nature, uh, changing due to various reasons. They could be picking certain alleles that are advantageous to survival and therefore they can be passed on more easily. And therefore again losing the variety of alleles. Then finally genetic bottleneck. Usually it's caused by a catastrophic event. So for example um, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tectonic plates movement etc. And usually because of that, uh, that would mean that uh, perhaps lots of organisms, lots of individuals of a particular species may be lost. They might have been killed in that particular event. That would lead to a decrease in the gene pool. So because of that, that means you're losing alleles to therefore reach a bottleneck where you, um, you originally had lots of alleles and then suddenly you have very, very few to pick from. And that usually leads to the founder effect. So for example, if there are tectonic plates movement where they separated um, a group of organisms to two different places, that means that because there are there are smaller groups now, therefore all of the genes or alleles would be coming from that particular small group of founders in that particular area. So again, small gene pool leading to a loss of alleles. When it comes to uh, answering questions in exams, so uh, be aware how to explain them. So keep in mind that you're increasing uh, genetic biodiversity if you're allowing more alleles to be formed or made and uh, you're losing genetic biodiversity if you have less alleles. I would say pick a few to make sure you know how to explain them and then just memorize them and use them in your exam. So previously we mentioned about species biodiversity, how we can calculate it using Simpson's index. But the thing is we need to know the number of uh, individuals in all of these different species and we do so by doing sampling. And as you can see, I've separated in a few parts. We've got random sampling and non-random sampling, and we use a variety of different equipment and techniques in order to do so. And then we will need to evaluate our data and see if uh, they're reliable. So first of all, let's talk about random sampling. Uh, you probably would have come across this anyways already by doing practicals, uh, which is basically you get a random coordinate uh, in a particular area, so usually let's say you lay out a 20 meter by 20 meter um, area and you get a random coordinate, you put your quadrat down and then count the number of individuals that you can see. So random sampling is usually used to estimate population sizes. Non-random sampling, on the other hand, uh, we can say there are three types. Uh, op the first type is opportunistic, which means you're simply picking whatever species that you can easily uh, calculate in an area. So it's actually the weakest form of sampling because you're choosing what to measure. 
So for example, in a classroom, you will probably pick uh, human beings as the, your uh, as your species for sampling rather than picking the number of plants or the number of bacteria that exist because obviously humans are much easier to count. Stratified sampling, on the other hand, refers to uh, sampling by different groups or strata, which is a, f a fancy word for groups. So for example, you can be sampling within the male uh, population and the female population and then you compare that. The more common type we talked about would be systematic sampling which often is done in correlation to random sampling as well if you're trying to investigate something. We have two types, the belt and the line uh, sampling or line transect and usually it is used to uh, find the distribution of particular species along a, a change of environment. The difference between belt and line transect is just simply line is using one tape measure and the belt uh, is using two tape measures and you're measuring in between those two uh, uh, tape measures. And we say that we need to evaluate the reliability of uh, our data and the reliability will be affected mainly by two things, bias and chance. Now bias is referring to what you pick to sample. So like I said, for example, opportunistic sampling would be uh, very weak in terms of that because you're it's very very much biased we can improve that by doing more random sampling so um, by making sure that you are using a random number generator rather than picking asking people to pick the numbers uh, would be a way to try to reduce the effect of bias or even completely remove it have a chance you can't really completely remove uh, the probability of chance affecting your result because it is random, it is by completely by chance. So the only way we can try to reduce the effect of chance is by increasing our sample size so that if the, even if there are any anomalies, we are trying to minimize the effect of anomalies in that particular uh, uh, sample, uh, data points. Last but not least in this particular part, we'll be talking about the equipment and techniques uh, of sampling. So you see that we can do, we need to use different things when we're sampling animals and plants because obviously animals can move around. Uh, so we need to use different uh, ways to sample them. Uh, here's a list of the things we can use. A puta, which is a, a little container where you can, uh, you, by suction, you can suck small insects on the trees, whatever, into a little tiny pot and can count them. Uh, pitfall traps usually duck digging a particular area on the ground and then covering it so that it, they don't drown if there is rain and then try to count how many organisms, how many insects will fall into that trap. Sweep nets, for example, if you're looking, uh, walking through long grass and trying to count butterflies or beetles, then you'll be walking around uh, using a net and sweeping it in a very systematic way to make sure it's fair uh, and then count the organisms as well. Capture mark release is usually used for larger animals uh, where you can, for example, if you're measuring the distribution or population sizes of giraffes, then you can capture one, mark it either with a, with a bio tag, usually nowadays with GPS uh, tracking, and then you release it and then you can track and see uh, uh, again and next time when you come around again and see if there's any changes in the population sizes. Plants is usually uh, the more common one that we will talk about in practicals or in exams because you will be asked to evaluate or know how to use quadrats in, uh, within sampling. So we say that quadrats can have three types. Uh, the point quadrats we probably don't use as much often. Usually you have a little frame like that uh, and then you have a particular needle, a very thin needle, and you can drop in the middle uh, through the particular frames, and then you count how many, uh, and then you count how many plants will actually touch uh, the needle uh, throughout that particular area, and then that will be a way of sampling as well. The more common type of uh, quadrat we use will be the frame quadrat, which is then used in the line transect. So the frame quadrat is like this: is a metal grid. Usually, um, there are different sizes of it, so you can have one meter by one meter, or 0.5 by 0.5 with uh, a designated number of squares within. So you can literally use that for uh, random sampling um, to count the population sizes or estimate the population sizes or use it within a line transect where you lay them down in the regular intervals and then count the number of species from within. There are three ways to use a frame quadrat. Number one, 
measuring the density, so simply counting the number of individuals within your frame quadrat. You can also do it by uh, measuring the frequency of appearance if it's a uh, slightly a smaller plant where there can be loads of it and you're just simply counting how many times they exist, how many squares within the entire frame would have that particular plant existing in it. Uh, or you can do percentage cover if it's if it's a plant that has lots and lots of individuals, for example, grass. You can't really count the number of grass, but you can count the percentage of cover of grass within the frame quadrat. So those are the three ways of doing so. And this is the general outline for the first half of biodiversity.